Well, hello, everyone. Glad you could join us for uh, this lesson two of our Walking in Truth uh, study about uh, how to study our Bible, how to properly interpret our Bible. And uh, we're thankful that you have joined with us once again. If you weren't able to catch lesson one yet, would encourage you to go back right here on our YouTube channel and you can find lesson one. And uh, what we did is we broke that down into kind of two parts. So kind of lesson 1A and then lesson 1B, just to kind of keep the the uh, time of these lessons uh, under an hour, or as uh, much as we can under an hour, and uh, that way you're not uh, discouraged by watching over two hours or so for each one of these lessons. And as we gave these at our church, uh, we just got in, in through uh, the first part of lesson uh, number two, uh, before all of the shutdowns and things hit, and we had a couple of hours during those sessions, and so we've uh, hopefully... Uh, broken these down a little bit better, and and uh, you're able to kind of watch these. And again, I would uh, say if you are not able to maybe do all of it all at one time, boy, feel free to hit that pause button and uh, go and do what you need to, and then you can restart it uh, right back where you you left off. And uh, I know that uh, life happens sometimes, and so if you need to do that, certainly you're welcome to do that. Did include a, a, a notes sheet, and so if you did not pick up a, a sheet uh, for the notes for this lesson at our church, then we've included a link for you to download that, and you can follow along. You can print that out at your home, and uh, you're certainly welcome to take notes on your own. And I'd encourage any of us who are watching this to do that, take notes. I know that's a help to me whenever I'm trying to learn something and getting getting it in. And, and uh, sometimes there are things that might not be on a slide or, or uh, just maybe are mentioned in a sentence, and I don't want to miss that. And so it's good to just take notes uh, whatever way that you can. And so I'd encourage you uh, to do that. I'm going to start with a word of prayer then uh, for this lesson, and we'll get right into it. Lord, we are grateful uh, for the day. Thank you again for the opportunity that we have to look into your Word. And Lord, as we think about how to best study your word and what uh, tools and, and things are a help to us, then uh, Lord, we want to make use of those things. And certainly, we, we know that you are a God of order, and uh, you have organized your word, and you have inspired it in a way that uh, we can uh, properly study and understand and get the proper interpretation. And we're grateful that interpretation is not uh, uh, just ours. It's not our ideas on things. It is your ideas. We're trying to understand what you say. And so help us in that study. And I pray it be a prophet to everyone who is watching. And we ask it then in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, take your outline then, and we're going to just uh, kind of jump right in uh, with our uh, study. And of course, we are calling this Walking in Truth Bible Study and Interpretation. And so on your list there, I believe we have started, uh, on your outline I should say, with just some kind of introductory thoughts, if you will, just some things, uh, some thoughts to ponder, uh, so to speak. And so the very first one that we have mentioned on the outline is the issue in Bible study and interpretation and in trying to find out what is uh, going to help us the most as we read through God's Word? I want to just emphasize and begin with, the issue here is not speed. It's not trying to get to as fast as you can. Uh, though I, I've used Bible plans, uh, such as uh, reading through the Bible 66 books in 66 days, I've, I've done that, and it's a lot of work. It's a little over an hour or so of reading each day. But the issue in what we're talking about today is not speed. Rather, the issue is direction. We want to be sure that we're going the right direction uh, in our Bible study. We, we don't want to get off uh, kilter or, or out of focus, so to speak, from what God is saying in this specific passage, wh whatever passage that is. It might be during our daily devotional work. It might be during a time when we're uh, getting together a lesson, maybe for a Sunday school class, or maybe to share in a small group or something like that. We want to make sure that uh, we are headed in the right direction, and uh, really that direction is the Lord's direction. And so it's not speed. It's not trying to go so fast in these things. Uh, in the matter of, of trying to get proper Bible interpretation. And learning to do it properly, such as this class, just trying to, to learn how to do it, is a process. It's, it doesn't come overnight. I, I wish that I could just reach through the, the screen there and uh, maybe smack you on the head or something and just say, hey, you, you've now got it. Uh, but it takes time, and it takes years uh, at times to just kind of get it to where we're, we're even comfortable with it. But don't again, don't let that discourage you. Um, just understand we're on that process together. We're trying to learn how these things work and uh, the best way to come up with the proper interpretation. So don't get discouraged by 
uh, what the speed may be. So then the second point there is that uh, personal Bible study and interpretation has a very specific aim. And again, it's not the speed part, it is the, the, the life change process. It takes time for God to, to use His Word and to work in our life, and for us to get to the point where we make those decisions in the soil of our heart, so to speak, is where it should be. And so the personal Bible study interpretation has a very specific aim, and that is life change. So without this, this firsthand, uh, prolonged personal exposure to the Word of God, you're never going to be directly involved with what God has to say. If I'm not digging into God's Word uh, on a regular basis, then how can I expect that what God has to say is going to get into my life? I I can't expect that. It doesn't come through some uh, uh, audible uh, presentation. He doesn't uh, write it in the sky and erase it and write it again. I I wish at times he would do that. But he has spoken to us through his word. Uh, I believe that Hebrews uh, mentions that in the very first chapter, that God who spake in the old times through the prophets has now spoken unto us by his Son. And uh, we are thankful for the word of God, for what it does for us, and uh, what it can do to us if we will let it. And so you, you don't have to depend on what someone else says in these matters. You don't have to to go to somebody else. You can understand what the Bible says in and of yourself, and I'm grateful for that. I'm glad that God just doesn't say, um, you know, well, go to the prophet or go to the priest or go to the pastor. He's the only one that really has any understanding, and he's gone to school to do that. Now, it's not wrong to ask for some help. Certainly, I wouldn't uh, ever uh, want you to think that. But I do want us all to understand that the same Holy Spirit who inspired God's Word is the same Holy Spirit who dwells within us if we're saved, and He's the one that gives understanding. And so we need to get into God's Word, uh, where He speaks to us, and then we need to allow God's Holy Spirit to do the speaking through the Word, all right? So it it has a specific aim, and that aim to all that what we're talking about— the, the desire to learn how to study God's Word is all about changing our lives. It's not just so that we get knowledge. Knowledge puffeth up, the Bible says. It's not just to, well, we know these things, we know these principles. Well, that's great, but how are they changing your life? And uh, we say that often around here because we, we believe God wants our lives to change, and He wants us to, to be molded into the image of His dear Son. And so that's why we're on this journey together, so to speak. So then let's uh, go to point number one, the overview of the Bible study process, and we're going to go through some of these, uh, just some kind of uh, some bigger topics, so to speak, and then we'll kind of break these down as we go. But uh, the overview of Bible study process, and and letter A on your outline there, is observation. Here's kind of the, the first step, if you will, observation. And the question here is, what do I see in the passage? This is kind of a a brainstorm session, if you will. It's time for me uh, to get into God's Word and just maybe um, similar to a brainstorming session, I just take a piece of paper or a notepad or my notebook, and I'm just writing things down, my observations, who's in the passage, who's being talked about, or or who's being addressed here, who's doing the speaking, what are they talking about, Uh, all of those things, what's the context, and so I'm observing these things. In other words, what are the facts that I am, I am observing in this passage as I read it? And so I'm, it's similar to becoming a Bible detective. I am, I'm getting all of the clues so I can put the picture together, all right? So we're looking for four things here, and I'm going to switch back and forth to the slides every so often so you'll be able to, to see uh, what maybe the blanks are. And so the first thought there, the first idea, number one, is the terms. I'm, I'm trying to observe the terms. I'm looking at the terms. And this is a key word that is crucial to what an author has to say because it unlocks the meaning of the passage. All right, and here's what I mean by that. When you read the Gospel of John, there's one word, I mean, there's several words, obviously, but there's one word that John uses often. In fact, I believe in the Gospel of John, he uses this word 79 different times, and it's the word believe. And so when I understand that when I'm kind of being Bible detective and I'm reading these words and I'm, I'm reading the passage and I come across words that, um, boy, they happen regularly. And, and in John, that word is believe. And the word in John, that word believe, that happens 79 times, 79 times rather, is a, it's a verb, it's not a noun. It is an action word. It is, it is someone putting action to what they have heard. They are believing on someone or something. And uh, we understand John's gospel is all about believing in Jesus Christ. He is the Son of God. And so John uses that word believe. 
uh, we might think about the book of Hebrews and uh, kind of that thought in Hebrews, and you'll read this word several times, is the word better. That's a key word. And we want to know those terms. And so as we look into our Bible and we look into that passage, what are the terms? What are, what are the words that God is using in those, those, uh, those times? All right. Those, those will help you to unlock, uh, so to speak, the meaning of the passage oftentimes. Now, Number two on your outline. The second thing that we're trying to observe is the structure of the passage. The Bible is not just a a random uh, book of stories and sayings and and different books. Now, there are different books in it. Yes, we understand that. But what is the structure? First of all, what is the grammatical structure? And that's letter A on your outline. What is the grammatical structure? In other words, what's the subject of the sentence? What is the object of the sentence? What what is the main verb that is occurring in the sentence? And I can almost hear through the, the, the camera, some of you groaning like, oh no, I thought I was done with grammar. Well, it helps us to know those things because it helps us to properly understand what the sentence is saying, what, what the dialogue is maybe in that passage of Scripture. Who's being addressed and who's doing the addressing and what are they talking about? So things like, again, the subject, the object, what is the main verb in that, uh, in that sentence or in that passage? And so the, the more that you know those things, the better off you're going to be in your understanding of what is being said. What is the command being given? That, that's an important thing. So we need to understand the grammatical structure, first of all. And then letter B on your outline, we need to understand the literary structure. There are questions and answers in that passage. That There's a climax and a resolution, so to speak. There's, there's cause and effect. All of these things are taking place within that passage of Scripture. So there's literary structure that needs to be understood so that when we look at a passage, we, we have... Um, we have the, an understanding of what is being said in this particular uh, uh, passage of Scripture, in this group of verses that I'm looking at, in this devotional thought. What is the, the, the grammatical structure? What, what's helping me technically in the passage? And then what is helping me literarily in the passage? Literarily, that might not even be a word. I might have just made that up. But it, it does help us to know the literary structure of the passage. What are the questions? What is, what's being asked? What's being answered maybe in that passage? What is the climax of the passage? What's the resolution to that climax that, that has been kind of foreshadowed or, or the scene is being set for that? All of those things play, play a, an important role in us understanding what's going on there, all right? So in the observation, we've talked about the terms and the structure. And then number three on your outline, we also want to have some understanding and and watching for the literary form of the passage. In other words, you might write in parentheses next to number three, the genre of this, the literary form of the genre. And uh, that is G-E-N-R-A, if if you haven't kind of seen that on a vocabulary list lately, the genre or the literary form of the passage. So there's a difference, let's say, between the Hebrew poetry, uh, Job and Psalms and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, that that Hebrew poetry poetry section, there's a difference between that and what we would look at the the epistles or the letters of Paul in the New Testament. There's just a different form uh, that is being used in the writing. Now, we understand God used different men to to write the the actual words of his Bible, of his his word, Uh, and he used, I believe, the the personalities and and, uh, the the life experiences of those individuals uh, in the writing of his scripture. And so what is the genre? What's being done here? Uh, Is it historical in nature? Is it poetical in nature? Is it uh, a letter sent to a church or to an individual? All of those things, again, give us help, and so we want to know the literary form of those things. So you, you think about in the in the Bible, there, there's history and allegory and poetry and prophecy, and there's comedy at points, there's tragedy, there's so much more than just even those things. There, there's a lot of different literary form in the Scripture. And so God, again, through inspiration of His Holy Spirit, uses each of these forms to communicate his message. Now, what is his message? Well, it's the gospel of Jesus Christ, and he uses all of these ways to communicate that. It's just It's tremendous how the Lord does that. And so if you grasp then the message, you, you must read each kind of genre according to its proper rules. And there are some rules. 
uh, how I interpret the poet, uh, the poetical books is different than how I would understand those uh, doctrinal or those uh, epistles, the, the letters that, that contain a lot of uh, the doctrine. How I read history, again, is, is a little bit different. How I understand how all that uh, came about and what is being talked about there, it just helps us to gain some understanding, all right? So we've got uh, observation. We're observing the terms and the structure and the liter- literary form. And then number four uh, on your outline, what we're looking for as we're brainstorming, we're looking through this passage, we're looking for the atmosphere of the passage. Again, this is picking up the setting. What, what's kind of the overall feeling of that biblical text? Now, I'm not trying to get, um, you know, kind of weird on it, but there is a certain feeling. Is it kind of ominous? Is it happy uh, in its mood, so to speak? What, what is the atmosphere in the biblical text? Uh, I oftentimes like to think about, as I'm reading that passage or that uh, maybe that, um, that chapter, what was it like to be in the author's shoes as he is writing this? And, and we often have heard maybe the book of Philippians, and we need to remember that's a book of joy. Paul talks about joy regularly in that passage. That's a term uh, in the, the book of Philippians. But then what is the, the atmosphere? Well, remember where Paul was writing from. He's writing from jail. And so what the message is, is even though in difficult circumstances, even in times where it's like, man, this is miserable, or we would, we would think... Boy, if, well, woe is me, feel sorry for me. Paul is saying, no, I can have joy in spite of whatever I'm going through. In the good times and the bad, I can experience joy. So the atmosphere helps us in those things. So you, you take in, as I kind of would write down uh, some observation, I'm going to try to use all of my senses in the passage. What was it like uh, to, to smell those, those fields in the evening as the shepherd is leading his sheep into those, by those cool waters or back to the sheepfold? Uh, what, what was it like when, when uh, David was surrounded by uh, that uh, army of the Philistines and, and, and behind him maybe is the army of the Israelites and he's facing Goliath? What did it smell like and what did it look like? And all of those things are, are good observations that helped us to see the atmosphere of what is going on. And does God give us some clues? Oh yeah, regularly he gives us clues about that and that helps us. So this gets to be a little bit of an exercise in the imagination, so to speak. Not just the intellect and thinking through logically through the passage or or through that uh, group of verses, but I'm able to use my imagination and I take what God says. Now, I don't want to put anything on the text, right? We, we mentioned that a little bit in the last couple of weeks. I'm not trying to, to, to be silly with it or, or put something there that's not there, but I do get to use my imagination a little bit in, in picturing what is going on in my mind. Can I picture that jail cell where, where Paul is? It's not like a jail cell today, uh, today, I can tell you that much. What was it like in those fields and in that, uh, in, in that backside of the desert when Moses sees the burning bush? Can you imagine what that is and what that was like? Now, most of us probably think of, you know, that movie, The Ten Commandments, where Moses Moses, you know, Charlton Heston parts the Red Sea, right? That usually kind of goes in our mind. Uh, but uh, just thinking through, what, what did that look like to walk through on dry ground? All of that is observation and helping us with the atmosphere of that passage. Now, let's move on to uh, letter B on your uh, outline. And so we started with observation. What do I see? Now, the second part of this is interpretation. So what do I take from what I saw? And then what does it mean? All right, what does it mean? or in other words, interpretation. So I don't start in interpretation and I don't end in interpretation. This is kind of the middle ground that helps me to get to where I need to go. So before I understand, I have to learn how to see, so to speak. I have to to take in all of the facts and all that is there in the passage, and then I can begin to understand what is being said in that passage. What does it mean, in other words, all right? So a few things that help us to to, to, uh, gather some and, and will help us in interpretation. So number one on your outline there is I need to ask some questions, all right? If you want to understand the passage that you're reading, you need to bombard it with questions. And I would say that the Bible is never afraid to be asked questions of. Truth is never afraid of questions. It's truth, regardless of what you might understand of it or not, it is still truth. So we need to ask some questions of the passage. Now, these might not always be answered right in that little section or in that little devotional thought or even in that sermon. That Those questions that I have might not always be answered right there. They might be answered somewhere else, but that's another part of this, uh, the, 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 the trick toward studying, okay? So I need to ask some questions, and I need to determine if those questions are answered here or maybe somewhere else, all right? So I'm, I'm going to start with some questions that I have, and then number two on the outline is part of interpretation— 
trying to find out what it means, I need to see what are the answers, all right? If you're going to ask questions, you also have to look for those answers, and they are found in the text itself, right? I'm not looking elsewhere. I'm not, I don't go to the book uh, that uh, my favorite author wrote or whatever. I go to the text, the, the passage of Scripture. I'm seeing the questions that come, God knows I'm going to have questions about it, and then what are the answers that he gives uh, to us through his word, all right? So observation then, that, that first thought, that was letter A on the outline, observation is going to give you the basic building blocks out of which we will construct the meaning of the passage, all right? We, we've observed, we've looked at the terms, and we've looked at the structure of the passage, we've looked at the literary form, we, we've got a sense of the atmosphere, we've asked some questions, and we've, we, we've hopefully found some answers right there from the text, but those are going to help us to construct what the meaning of the passage is. And so the answers to your questions questions will come directly from your observation process. So I might have a question, and oftentimes the answer is right from those things that I observed during my observation time, all right? The things that I found in the passage are going to help me uh, to find the answer to the questions that I have as I read that passage of Scripture. And the more time you spend in observation, that is step number one, that's letter A, all right? The more time I spend in letter A, the observation, the less time I will be spending in letter B, the interpretation of that, all right? And, and the results then, the more time I spend asking questions of the text, and the more time I spend uh, trying to just brainstorm, find all of those things that are going to help me, the more time I spend there, the less time I'll spend in interpretation, and the better, the more accurate my results are going to be, the, the better my interpretation of that passage and my understanding of that passage is going to be. And then vice versa is also true. The, the less time that I spend in observation, the less time that, the less work that I do in just kind of getting through that passage and culling all of that stuff through, the less time I spend no, more, uh, there, the more time I'm going to have to spend in, in interpretation. And I would say that my interpretation is going to be less accurate that way but because I haven't taken in all the, the facts, so to speak, the, the observations in the passage. I haven't taken all of those things out. My interpretation that then is going to be uh, less accurate. All right. So then number three, Hey, we've, we, we've done our work and we've asked some questions and we've looked for the answers there. And then what we're talking about now in number three is integration. And you put the answers together into a meaningful whole. All right. Otherwise, all that we do is we end up with a bunch of fragments. All right. We just have a bunch of facts out there. And what integration does is we're putting those pieces all together and I'm putting the answers to the questions. I am, I am putting all the facts, and I'm gaining an understanding of what God is saying to me individually through the passage that I am trying to study. All right, so integration is the stage where you reconstruct the meaning of a passage after you've taken it apart to inspect the details. All right, so I'll say that again. This is the stage. This, this number three, integration, is where you reconstruct the meaning of a passage after you've taken it apart to inspect the details all of what's there. I'm going to look at it all, and then I'm going to put it back together. All right. Now then, let's talk about letter C on your outline. Okay. Letter C. Letter C is application then. And here's what I'm, I'm answering here. How does it work? Application is how does it work? Not, not asking, does it work? It does work. This is God's word, right? It works. It has the power uh, the question is not, does it work? The question is, how does it work? All right. And if the Bible, I hear all the time, you, you might hear this also in different, different avenues, but I hear regularly from pastors of different, all different kind of faiths or, or uh, different types of churches that, uh, you know, even is in the byline, maybe or in an advertisement somewhere, well, we're, we're making the Bible relevant uh, for our lives today. And can I just say, I think that's the wrong way to look at that. Not to demean those folks or those, those churches necessarily just by that, but if the Bible isn't already relevant, then you and I are not going to make it more relevant. There's no way that I can improve on what God has already said. Now, can I make some application? This is what I think they're trying to say, is are we making application of what God's Word says? Yes, and that's what we're saying here in, in letter C. How does all of this work then in my life? The Bible is already relevant. We're not making it more relevant. What we are doing is making application to our life. We are taking what God has said in his word and then making it apply, helping it us to understand it so that we can make it work in our life, all right? Uh, so that it will change the way that I live my life. And so the Bible really, 
uh, is a, a, what we might consider a return to reality. It is, boy, I get in, in my mind all kinds of weird thoughts, and I hear, you know, I'm influenced by uh, maybe this, this person or this book or this pastor or this way of doing things. And uh, the Bible then for us, if we're honest with it, and if, if we're allowing it to be honest with us, it is a return to reality. This is what is true. Uh, this is what is factual. And I need to get back to this, and that's why we're doing this, this class, this lesson, is because we want to properly understand what God is saying here. So the application is, does it work? All right. Now, on your outline, I think you've got some questions there under letter C. So number one, then, how does it work for me? All right. How does it work for me? That's part of the application. It can often be easier to see how it works or applies to someone else, but we need to ask this personal question first, right? I shouldn't come to a Bible passage and say, boy, I wish somebody else would read this passage. I wish my sister or wish my mother-in-law or whatever would read the passage. No, no, I need to be asking the question, what does this mean for me? How does this work for me? Not how do I twist the scripture, but what is God saying? I've done the observation. I've done the interpretation. Now, uh, this needs to have a message for me. God is speaking to my heart about this, and so how does this work in, in my life individually? And if the truth isn't working in my life, then then what authority, honestly, do I have to share it with someone else? In, in reality, there, there's a credibility gap. If I'm not doing what it says, if I don't think it's, it's worthy of changing my life, if I'm not giving my life to it, then why on earth would I say it to somebody else? Why, how can I give that to somebody else? They're going to see that, and they're just going to think I'm spouting off some untruth or, or some something to try to influence them away from what the truth of God's Word is, because God's Word is true, and it is sharp and it's powerful. It's sharper than a two-edged sword, the Bible says in, in Hebrews 4. And so I need to have it changing my life, all right? So how does it work for me? But then secondly, and here's the next question, how does this passage work for others? How does the passage work for others? How could this not only transform my life, how could this transform somebody else's life? How could this affect their marriage or their relationship with the Lord or their relationship with their, 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 their children, maybe, or at their workplace? How do we take what God is saying in this passage of Scripture, and how do we make that apply to the 92-year-old lady who's sitting in the third row and the person who's struggling at their workplace or at their school uh, in the back row? How, how do we make the application to all of those, those people? And, and it's only God can do that. And we need the Holy Spirit's help in doing that, maybe as we give a lesson, but we need to be thinking about that in our own personal Bible study. What is, how does this work in my life? And then how can I be a help to that, my, my, the student who sits across from me? Uh, how can I be a help to that, that person in the next cubicle? Uh, how do I help my neighbor with this same truth that God is working in my life? How can it affect me in all of those ways? And I need to think through that in making the application, all right? So the, that's the application part of that. All right, so we, we talked about the, the overview then, and we went through observation and literary form and interpretation and application. Now, Here's point number two, Roman numeral two, if you will, on your outline, uh, some, some habits to, to cultivate, and, and we've picked out three of these habits to cultivate, so to speak. And number one, or letter A on your outline then, is just reading, all right? Not uh, talking about browsing or looking for something just to catch your interest. No, no, it is reading. So, so Bible study requires conscious, uh, concentrated effort. I'm getting my Bible out, and I am reading it for what does God have to say in this individual passage? I want to be reading what God is saying, all right? So, so Bible study requires that, that concentrated effort, and I oftentimes, in fact, as I'm writing maybe a sermon or a lesson, I want to read that passage over and over and over and over again. I want it to get into my heart and get into my mind. I want to be kind of mulling over those words, and, and to use a Bible word, I want to be meditating on what that passage is saying. I want to read it over and over and over again. It helps me even to just memorize it or hide it in my heart if I can, uh, so that as I'm going through my day, I'm thinking through the passage, and that helps me again with the, the uh, observation. I'm thinking through the words, and I, it helps me with my interpretation. What is God saying here? And putting the pieces together, and then that application, right? And so I want to be reading the passage. And so as you read more, the, the passage, those verses, those truths tend to become more clear. 
Some people it helps, even just this is just a practical thing, some people it helps to, for them to read it out loud, right? Not just read it quietly or, or in their mind, but reading it out loud. Uh, some people will take uh, maybe an app on their phone and they will use the, the Bible app on their phone that might have some, some voice to those passages and they'll just play that passage, maybe as they're driving in the car or as they're doing their workout or whatever, and they'll just hear that passage and it helps them. Maybe they're, they're a, uh, an auditory learner. And so all of those ways to get just read it over and over and over and over again. It helps, it's going to help you, and it's a great habit to cultivate as you're studying in God's Word, all right? So then letter B on your outline in these habits is to then record. In other words, write down some notes. I think it's a good thing to, to keep a notepad or maybe just a three by five card with you and write some notes down. Jot down what you're seeing in the passage. Make some observations in that. You know, you you, you write the passage at the top and you just write down some things. Again, this, this is helpful in the the observation stage, of course, but just you're, you're writing down those things as, as God is giving them to you. So keep a record of your, your insights. Write down those questions or type out those questions, maybe in a, a, an app that kind of keeps notes for you. How, whatever works for you, I just want you to use it. So you, you cannot build a lesson or you cannot build a sermon or you cannot build that application, that, that help that you're going to share with maybe your coworker or your schoolmate. You can't build on something that you do not have. You have to have uh, uh, God working and moving, and you have to be observing those things. And so you, you can't build on something that you don't have. And in, so in your own words, then, you're summarizing what your observations are of the text, of that passage. You're, you're summarizing your observations and your insights so that you're able to go back to them, all right? So I've read this passage, and maybe there's a word there, the, the way that it's phrased is phrased a little bit differently than what we might do today. And so I might just rewrite that. How would I say this? Uh, to someone who I'm giving it in a message, or I'm giving it in a, a sermon, or I'm giving it in a devotional thought, or I'm just I'm trying to talk to my coworker. How would I say this uh, in, in a way that we might speak today that he might understand it maybe a little bit easier? So just write those, those things down. That's a good thing to do. Is just reading and recording, and then letter C on your outline. How about reflecting on that? Taking some time to think about what you've seen, what you've written down, those, those passages that you've been reading. So I'm, I'm taking time to, to, to just think about what it is that I've been going over in God's Word. So I'm asking questions like, what's going on in this passage? Can I relate to somebody? What is happening here? What, what's the storyline? What, what's the scene, so to speak, in this? I might ask something like, what is this telling me about God? Or what is this telling me about myself, right? There, oftentimes there's, there's both of those aspects in the passage. But what is this telling me about God? What is this telling me about myself? And then what do I need to do based on what I am reading in the passage, right? What do I need to do based on what I'm reading in the passage, what has God said? How do I understand that? And then how do I make application in my own life? All right. And I'm looking to see how long we've gone in this, this uh, lesson. Looks like about, it's about a half an hour. And for us, I think that might be a, a, a decent place to stop right there in the, uh, the first couple. So we're going to come back next week and we're going to hit uh, the third uh, part, which is, uh, I believe, over on the back side uh, of your note sheet there. We're going to hit the third part, and that is rules for interpreting the Bible. And so there's 11 of those that we're going to use and we're going to expand on as we go through this lesson. But there's uh, these rules for interpreting the Bible. And so these are the things that we're going to use to help us when we do step two, right? That, that interpretation phase. After we've gathered the facts, we're going to use these rules then to help us to come up with a proper interpretation. So we're going to stop there with those habits to, to cultivate, and I want you to just be thinking about that. So as you read, maybe in your own personal devotional time, take out a, a notepad or a, a, just a three by five card or four by six card, or you, know, you type it on your laptop, your iPad, what, however it works again for you, just make some observations. Uh, think through the passage. What is God saying here? Who's doing the speaking? What is he saying about himself? What is he saying about me? And then how do I make application in my own life? What does this mean in affecting me? How should I change my living? And then how does this maybe apply to others in my life? And uh, those are good things, good ways to start in this, just practical helps 
to get us started in this matter of Bible interpretation. And what we're going to do then in the following weeks is just kind of build on those. And we'll give some practical examples just from the Bible. And, and we'll take a passage and kind of work our way through those things. And so I hope you'll, you'll join us for the rest of these lessons. Hope it's been a help to you so far uh, today. And so we'll close maybe in a word of prayer and ask the Lord to help us as we uh, strive to uh, study and be students, rightly dividing the word of truth. I think that's what we ought to be. So let's pray then together. Lord, we're thankful uh, for your goodness to us, for your kindness. And we do ask that you would help us as we look into studying your word. May may we be good students uh, of the word that you've given to us. Help us understand that you're speaking to us. You've preserved it for us and inspired it for us. And so, Lord, help us understand it and then apply it to our own life. May it change the way that we live. And we'll thank you for the help and, and help us to stay faithful in these matters. And, Lord, may the Bible just come alive because of what you're doing uh, as a result of our just getting into it and diving into it and studying it. We'll thank you again for all that you do. And we love you. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, that's it for today. We'll see you next week. We'll, we'll try to do these every Tuesday around 7 a.m. We'll release these. And so I hope you're able to join us each and every Tuesday. If not, boy, they'll be on the YouTube page or the YouTube YouTube channel rather you can go back and, and review these things and I hope they're a help and if you have questions please submit those and uh, you can uh, hopefully comment you can uh, send us an email at info at tbcaustin.com if you have my personal cell phone you can certainly send me a text or you can email our church or even call uh, if you're out of town or whatever if you're able to comment in some way uh, we'd love to hear from you if you've got a question or, or something like that and so we'll try to cover those we didn't get any this past week but we'll try to cover those in the uh, uh, succeeding weeks as we go through. So if you got any comments or questions, boy, we're, we're happy to hear those as well. All right, we'll let you go for today. Hope it's an enjoyable time for you. Hope it's profitable for you and hope the Lord uses it in all of our lives.